Finally, last problem on the bottom. It says, determine the mass of oxygen in a 450 gram sample. Well, this is kind of like saying, determine the number of red M&Ms in a one pound bag of M&Ms. So we know how big the bag is, and we also hopefully know what percent of the bag is red. It doesn't matter if it's a little snack size bag or if it's a gigantic one pound bag. It's still gonna be a certain percentage of red. So we already did some uh, legwork. We figured out the percent that's oxygen. So this is the percent that's oxygen. So I'm gonna take my percent and set that equal to what I know, my part divided by my whole. I don't know the part that's oxygen or the part of M&Ms that are red, but I do know that the total thing is gonna be 450. It gives me that right here. So percent equals part divided by whole. This is a percent. I can't put percents in my calculator until I move the decimal point over. So 0.652, and then you multiply each side by 450. X should equal 293.4 grams. So in that sample, 293.4 grams is oxygen. The rest is the hydrogen and sulfur. And if you want to check your answer, plug it back in. Plug it in for the X spot is 293.4 divided by 450, is that equal to 65%? If so, then you did it right. So always try to check your answers. Okay, part two is on chapter 11, all of chemical reactions. Now you should know the difference between the reactants and the products of reactions. Know which is on which side. Um, the reactants are on the left side. You should also be able to tell if something is a solid, a liquid, or a gas using abbreviations. So if it's a solid, for instance, if I said a reaction involves sodium chloride. Well, if I hand you salt crystals as solids, you would put an S next to the NaCl. If I say, here's some salt, go melt it, go heat it to absurdly high temperatures and melt it, then you would put an L next to it indicating that it's a liquid. It's this substance melted. Uh, we wouldn't be able to turn this into a gas, but if it was a gas, you'd put a G. And if it was aqueous, we would say that this stuff has to be dissolved in water, which would be different than just melting it and having a liquid form of NaCl. Okay, aqueous, like I just mentioned, dissolved in water. Precipitate are solid particles. It's insoluble in the rest of the solution. And you mix two solutions and all of a sudden you get the solid chunky stuff. Usually we use a downward arrow to indicate that it's a precipitate that's been formed. Reversible reaction, we use a double-sided arrow, so you should see uh, pointing both ways. Sometimes the arrows are equal, sometimes they might be unequal, just indicating that a reaction is more likely to happen in one direction than another. Which seven elements form diatomic? Remember the prefix di means two, two atoms, so these guys always hang out in pairs. Now remember on your periodic table, if you start with nitrogen, it kind of forms a seven. Nitrogen, ox oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and then iodine. It looks like a seven. Those are only six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you gotta throw in little hydrogen, and there's your seventh of the seven diatomics. Okay, so make sure you remember that anytime they're not paired with something else, then it hangs out in pairs. For instance, chlorine, if it's uh, paired up with sodium, then it's gonna be NaCl, but if it's paired up with, uh, or if it's not paired up with anything, then it would just hook up in uh, pairs itself, so it would be Cl2. Okay, you should be able to balance equations and identify which kinds of reactions they are. Some things to remember when you're balancing and you have a two on one side and three on the other, try to make both sides have a grand total of six. You should worry about oxygens last. You should treat polyatomic ions as a package if they show up on both sides. If they do show up on both sides and you remember your polyatomics, you're going to be ahead of the game. It'll be easier for you. If, if uh, you don't remember them or recognize them, or it shows up only on one side and it breaks down on the other side or gets rearranged, then you have a little more work to do. So you're hoping that those polyatomics will show up on both sides. And anytime you have odd numbers, you're going to double them to get even. Okay. Make sure you never change the subscripts. So if um, H2O is written there and you need two oxygens, you can't go just stick another two down there because now that's hydrogen peroxide, it's not water anymore. So if you need two oxygens, you gotta big, put a big coefficient two out front. That'll get you your two oxygens. It'll also affect your hydrogens. It'll give you four H's, so make sure that the H's are uh, taken care of. You only add or change coefficients. These big numbers out front here, you never ever ever touch the subscripts. Once you're finished, always recheck your equation. 
Um, sometimes if you fix one thing, it affects something else and you gotta go back and, and refix that. So make sure when you're done, you go through it and say, did I completely balance everything? How many of these, how many of those? How many of these, how many of those? Take a couple extra seconds, it'll save you uh, some points on your exam. Combination synthesis, types of reactions. When we take simple substances, two or more, combine them together to form a more complex new substance. So if we take A by itself, B by itself, put them together, you get a new thing, AB. Decomposition is the opposite of this. Start with the AB, start with the complicated substance, break it down into two simpler things. Single replacements like the dating couple. Here's the single guy. A is the single person. And BC is the dating couple. Remember, B is happy dating C until A comes along. If A decides A wants to be with C, then A and B, the two metals, the two males in the analogy, uh, they'll kind of fight it out, and whoever's more reactive will get to be with C with the non-metal. So if A is stronger than B, A will replace B and start dating just like over here. But imagine if A wasn't as strong as B. A challenges B, A is not as strong, so B gets to hang on, and then you would see no reaction. A would attempt to replace B, but it wouldn't actually be able to do it, so we wouldn't see any signs of a reaction, and that would be no reaction. Double replacement, we typically use the square dancing analogy. A is happy with B, C is happy with D in two separate containers. You mix them together during the dance, and now all of a sudden, a is going to hook up with D, and C and B are going to hook up. The only thing I recommend here is that you check to make sure you put the metals first. Metals always go first, these cations. I know when you take the A and hook it up with D, most kids have no problem with that, but then they say, well, B hooks up with C, and sometimes that might end up looking like this, for example, C, L, and A. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So if the CL and the A were going to hook up, just make sure you rearrange it so the NA comes first, followed by the CL. Okay. Finally, combustion. This should be the easiest example to look at because it's always some sort of fuel, which is a hydrogen and carbon, some sort of combination. So that's our fuel plus oxygen. You all know you need oxygen to have a fire. And you always make, if it's a complete combustion reaction, carbon dioxide and water. Always, always, always. So you're always looking for a fuel plus oxygen, and on this side of the equation, it should always, always, always be carbon dioxide and water. If you see that, it's automatically combustion. All right, balancing these guys. These guys are all balanced or ready for you. Take a peek at the answers. Again, pause it if I'm going too quick, which I probably am. This last one, let's do this one out real quick. Again, pause it, make sure you can do all the other ones or you've got them right. But let's take a look at this last one while I'm on the video. You've got, forget about these, uh, these guys right now. Let me show you the thought process here. You start with two carbons. Over here, there's only one, so you're going to fix that. Initially, you're going to put a two there. Hopefully, you want to do this in pencil. Then you've got six hydrogens over here. You've only got two here, so the logical thing would be to do is to put a three there. Oxygens, two oxygens here. You've got one, two, times two, so there's four oxygens there, plus three gets distributed, three here, four plus three is seven. So that means on this product side, you've got seven oxygens. But over here, you need something times two to get seven. That's not gonna work, you can't put 3.5. So instead, we're gonna figure out which one's making it odd. Two times two is giving us an even four. Three times one is giving us an odd number. So this one's making it odd, so we're gonna double that. 3 doubled is 6, 3 doubled is 6, and then that gives us, we'll worry about oxygens last, that gives us 12 hydrogens. So we go back here and we say, well, now we need 12 hydrogens. 6 times 2 will give us 12 hydrogens. That'll fix the H's, but it also affects the carbons, so now we have 4 carbons, so we go back to this number, and lo and behold, we double this also. So there's 4 carbons. Now all the carbons and H's are taken care of. Let's look at the oxygens. Four times two is now eight. That number got doubled. And six times one is six. Eight plus six is 14. And then what goes here? Seven times two will give us 14. So you're going through the problem. You're thinking you're doing everything right. And then you get to an odd number of oxygens. Then you have to go back and say, who's making it odd? Let's double that. And then go back and see all the ripple effect. What does that affect? And fix everything else, okay? Types of reactions.